Alright. You guys care if I take a picture? Go for it. Correct. All right. Prove that people actually came to my talk. Because <laughs> this is four o'clock in the afternoon. So um, if you've ever run a long race, this is like you know the last uh, 400 on a two mile race. All right. So today I'm going to talk about assembly. I was hoping to do a live demo, but of course the demo god said no. Um, so. <laughs> I couldn't actually connect to uh, AWS, so good thing I prepared my slides. So, does anybody know why you might want to learn assembly? Understand how programs work. Understand how programs work, yes, very much. That's why I always taught my computer science students that. Torture yourself? <laughs> Possibly torture yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now we're reversing it. Yeah. Optimize yeah. yeah. for max performance. Reverse engineering, possibly performance. Compilers these days are actually awfully good, um, so they tend to do a really good job of that. So what all the crap in the ER actually means? Yeah, so if you're reverse engineering, right, and you're going to look at some binary code and you want to know what it is, um, that's a great way. The last thing is probably if you want to write shell code, you might need to know a summary. Right? So all right, so a few basics on computer architecture. Um, I am not a computer engineer. I am by trade a computer scientist. Um, so I learned a little bit of assembly um, when I was in college, but then I got a job where I needed to actually reverse engineer some uh, quote unquote malware that the government wrote. Um, and so I had to um, I had to do that as well teach some of my courses. All right, so binary instructions are run on the computer. Right, they are the lowest level that is accessible by the user. We're not going to talk about microops. Uh, microops are actually what runs on the computer. So when we talk about fetch, decode, execute, and store, those are actually done by microops, and they're basically the same on all computers, regardless of which architecture you use, except for the sort of decode piece. Um, so example here, um, there is some binary. I don't know how many of you uh, would like to read that. Probably not very many. A little bit better is hexadecimal, and then a little bit better will be assembly, right? So assembly is a lot easier to read. So hex is actually pretty simple. So every um, every hexadecimal digit, which you need two hexadecimal digits to get a byte. Anybody know what half of a byte is called? Nibble. A nibble. Very good. Thank you. Right? So each of these hex digits or nibbles represents four bits, right? And the nice part about that is that we can represent with the numbers zero through nine and then A through F. Um, and so when you get to reading assembly, you're going to have to sort of be able to do that translation um, if you need to figure out what the bits exactly are. We also have a couple other representations. So we've got um, two's complement, which is used for positive and then negative numbers. Um, floating point, which we'll talk about later. Um, everything can be represented as bytes. So bytes are actually the lowest addressable thing that you could do inside of a computer. And then we've got sort of our printable characters. So we got ASCII, which is seven or eight bits, depending on your definition. And then we got Unicode, which is between two and five bits, depending on your um, language, right? And that supports all of the characters sort of outset, outside of, you know, our Latin character set that we have. So in a Computer, right? We have these registers. They are as fast as you can go on the clock, right? So if your clock is running at three gigahertz, that means you can do three gigahertz times the number of instructions per second if your computer is operating as fast as it can. They are very expensive. They are very limited. We only have between 10 and 15, 20 of them, uh, depending on your architecture. Uh, here are a few examples EIX, EBX. Um, the reason for their funny names is because they date back to the old year 16 bit computers that use registers like A and B. Um, so we extended, these are actually 32 bit examples. Um, and then the computer basically moves the data from memory, either your hard disk or RAM, into the processor, executes that, and then it might need to store some data and it might go back and forth as far down as you can go. All right, and then memory layout. So if we talk about RAM, 
or maybe a cache that's sitting in between. Um, I think it's easiest to think about it, the lowest address being on the lower right and sort of going up. So if you move a D word into this memory location and your D word is cafe babe, right? BE is actually at the lowest address. Now, if you did that as bytes, your lowest byte would be CA because we have little Indian, which is a little bit different than big Indian. So little Indian means that the um, lowest bit uh, comes on the right side as opposed to on the left. Um, not everybody wants to draw memory like this, but I think uh, when you're first coming into it, right, the sort of confusion of, between like, oh, I thought I moved this into it and it didn't really um, sort of jive with what you thought. And then in addition, we have the stack, which we'll talk about it in a little bit. I like to think of it as a stalactite. Some of you will see that people think of it as a stalagmite. Right? We'll talk about that. Uh, but memory is actually allocated in pages. Anybody know why it's allocated in pages? That's just what the on the mute address. So it's allocated in pages because you actually can take a page in memory and write it back to disk and put something else in for it. Right? That's how your computer. You guys ever use the page file? Or have you ever ran out of the page file? I've done that before. Yes. Uh, the moon killer. Max, Max, are especially especially awful at managing the page file. I've had I have sixty four gigs of RAM in my computer, and it will literally have thirty gigs free and a six gig page file. Like, what the heck are you doing, Max? Come on, put it back in the RAM. Uh, but pages allow the OS to switch these in and out, so that a different program can be loaded or a, one program can be paused that needs more memory. All right, so a computer basically runs by the instruction pointer says, hey, do this instruction. Does that instruction, right? And then it might need to store some data. It might need to load some data, right? That's what the new ops will do, right? They'll actually load the data, do the operation, and then store the data. And there's a whole scheduler. If you want to see, there's lots of really good talks about that. Um, and then once it's done with that execution, by the way, x86 is variable length instructions, right? So some instructions take one byte, some instructions take two or four, or I think five or six or seven is the max. Um, I don't see that a lot. Um, so then the instruction pointer has to add whatever the size of the instruction is to figure out what the next instruction is. We can actually contrast that with ARM. So ARM is fixed, fixed size instructions. So thumb mode, I think, is two bytes, and then regular is four bytes for ARM, for to execute. And thumb mode is the whole thing, and again, we're not going to talk about that because there's lots of details. All right, so assembly language is represented by whichever architecture we have. I put up here three of them, ARM, x86, x64, and you, typically if you have x64, right, you get x86 sort of included in the package. I didn't put your risk by, that's another one. Um, somebody likes that one, right? And so we take our program that's written in C or whatever our language is, and we boil it down to a bunch of binary that gets run on a computer. Well, the beauty about assembly is we can pull it up one level and say, oh, I know what these instructions are, right? I can take that binary and say, oh, that's a push operation, even though, right, I don't see push in C, right? There is no push in C. And so with our assembly, we basically have mnemonics or instructions. We'll talk about those. You can have a hardware address, and then I already mentioned that it's byte accessible, right? So you can't address a bit, right? Everything has to be a byte or bigger. Sorry, I just got over a cold where I couldn't talk for four days, so I'm getting better at that. All right, so our mnemonics, which is the term you'll see in assembly, so that is what the instruction is, or we can call it an operation, right? And it describes what we're going to do. Here's a couple of examples. Push EDP, right? Or move EAX1. So move EAX1 means I'm going to take the number one, and I'm going to move it into the register EAX. And EAX has, anybody know how many bits? 32, right? So I get one bit in there that's set to a one, and all the other 31 bits are going to get set to zeros, okay? And then our operands sort of, um, they customize, right? So we have the operation and then we have the operands. So the operands are like your function arguments, right? So they customize how that instruction runs. So the number one is going to say, I'm going to put the number one into the register EAX. Now, if you ever 
do programming, like I totally recommend, I don't know how you say it, I'm gonna say it wrong, Jeff, I think is how he says it. Jeff? I think he says it, Jeff. But it's basically a GDB plugin that adds, it's really hard for you guys, maybe it's a little better for you. It's hard for me to see back there. So it breaks us into different sections representing what's in the stack, what's in our code. If you look at the top, you can see all the registers that are in there. And so this breaks it up so you can, as you're stepping through it, and if I could have connected to my server, I would have shown you guys a stepping through a program, right? But needless to say, I can watch as this goes through and I can see, okay, here's what happened with this instruction. I can compare what I, what I had before to what I have now. So it's, it's a really nice plugin. So I recommend it a lot. All right, so what are the things that we can do? We can move data, do math. We can implement comparisons or conditional execution, right? Which, if you guys program in Python or C or C++ or Visual Basic, God forbid, right? <laughs> right, you got like if statements, right? So we can do those. We can call functions, right? You guys write functions if you write something in a high-level language. And then we got the sort of biggest thing, which is possibly interacting with the operating system, right? So not everything runs in user land, some of it you have to go and execute on there. And then we do have variable number arguments. There's a couple that have zero arguments, so like the clear direction flag has zero arguments, um, but a lot of them have one or more. Can you guys read this? I thought the screen was here. If you can't read it, you should come sit with seats in the front. Perfect for seeing. Right. So, is this all the laser pointer? Nope, it does not. All right. So, if we look on the top, we can see that we have an include statement so you can actually write libraries um, if you need to. Um, on line three, I define a string, right? And you have to define sort of, it gives you a couple nice things, right? So, there it says hello. Um, if you look in there, there's a 10. Anybody know the ASCII for 10? What is that? Oh my gosh. It's a new line, right? So it'll print off a couple new lines for us. If you look at my output, you can see there's a new two new lines after it. And then zero. That means it's a null terminating string, like we have in C. So we can see that we are doing some stuff. I put, and again, it's kind of hard to read, but I put some nice comments in here saying, okay, I'm moving. Uh, Cafe Babe into DIX, and then loading this um, variable high. So high is on line three. I'm loading the address of it and putting it in EAX. I'm then changing the byte at the very first index. So what's the very first byte is? H. Uppercase H, right? So I change that uppercase H to a lowercase H. I then go in and take EAX, which is an address. And I add five to it. So if you count five, hello has four letters. Okay, so it's going to take that space and it's going to turn it into a comma, right? So these are all things that you might do in C, right? But we can see that we can actually do them in assembly and then the very bottom I'm calling a function, right? Print string, which is actually in the library that I helped write. I actually so when I taught assembly, um, I was looking for a book. I first tried to type teach assembly on Windows. That was a nightmare, trying to get <laughs> all of my students to install Visual Studio and then be able to run it. And I said, screw that. I don't want to do open source. Right? So I actually ran it on Linux. There's a guy named Paul Carter who sold a book at one point. Um, you can buy it on one of those print, print on demand services uh, for like five or ten dollars. Um, and he had a library and I actually updated it so that it was a little bit simpler and easier for my students to use. So for example, you can see that um, I'm calling print string. It's actually included in the library on line one. Um, and so that's just a nice way to print it. Uh, we'll show another example later. So again, math, right? We got all of our sort of basic things that we can do. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. We got bit manipulation, so we can rotate bits around, right? So rotate as you move it over. And then the thing that falls off the end, so it goes back to the beginning. A shift, you rotate, but the thing that falls off, <coughs> falls off, just disappears. And then we got our 
Um, binary operations we do on binary numbers, so and, or, XOR. Anybody know what XOR? What do we use that for? Uh, well, we use it for encryption. We use it for encryption, right? Yeah. And if you, again, sorry, you can't read it. So I actually, in here, I am um, XORing EAX and EBX twice. And if you look at the bottom, uh, EBX, so it changed from uh, Cafe Babe to this F, uh, or sorry, CA, so it's a different value because it's EAX and EBX. EBX. XOR together, but then I XOR one more time and I get back the original thing. Right, so the beauty of XOR is it allows us to do encryption. Um, if you have a random text, right, which is generated by some key, either symmetric or asymmetric. All right, so then we have flags. So flags tell us about, it says the current state, but it's really like what happened in the previous state. So I did some operation and it might have set a flag, right? So I did a subtract and oh, by the way, when I subtracted them, the zero, like the actual value was zero. So then we get this thing called a zero flag sent. So the zero flag means the result of the previous operation was zero. And the nice thing about the flags is they allow us to do this conditional execution. So I can either do the next instruction or I can like jump over here and do some other instruction, right? And that's how you get your ifs and your whiles and your do's and all of those fancy things, right? So those are built out of that. And typically we don't actually just use it on a math operation. Typically we use it on either a compare or a test. Compare takes the two things and subtracts them. Right? If you get a zero, guess what? Zero flag gets set. That's what I use a lot. Um, test actually does a binary AND, so it will AND them together, right? And if you AND two things and you get a zero, guess what? They don't have any bits that match, right? So we use these when we write things like loops. And we do that by using jumping, right? So there's two types of jumps. One is called an unconditional jump. What would you guess that would mean? Jump no matter what. Jump no matter what. Perfect, right? So that means always I'm going to jump to this spot, as opposed to a conditional jump, which means only jump when Simon says, right? <laughs> and if Simon doesn't say, you keep doing the next thing that's in there. All right, so a couple examples. You can see jump zero, jump carry, jump not zero, jump below, jump above, jump above equal. There is a whole list of them. Uh, you can do inside x86. And then the one that sort of makes all of your functions possible is calling functions, right? So, you know, even if you're calling a function in some interpreted language like Python, eventually it has to boil down to something actually calling a function on the back end. All right? So, the thing that is always confusing to students, right, is that we're going to use the stack. We'll talk about the stack. We'll talk about that later. But what it does is it says, oh, I need to go do this function. So what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm executing instructions one at a time. I need to go do that other thing. But the next thing I need to do is this next instruction. So it takes the address, that next instruction, that address, and it says, I'm going to put that onto the stack. Okay? So it puts it on the stack. And then you go do the function. Right? So do all this. Right? Save my stuff. Then it comes back and it says, oh, I need to go do that instruction that you said, right? So the function that gets called then pops that thing off and says, oh, that's my next instruction, right? And if you mess this up, your program will say call. I guarantee it. The students do it all the time, right? So, you know, the biggest rule is whatever you put onto the stack, you got to take off, right? Because if you don't, it's going to go and jump to some location, and it's probably some memory that you do not have access to, right? Because we have computers that are segmented, right? Different portions of memory are allocated for different user programs. Some might be kernel. Some may not be mapped at all into memory, right? So the computer can pick out of all those addresses, right? I don't know. What is 2 to the 64? It's a really big number. You don't have that much RAM in your computer, right? But the address space is 2 to the 64. And then, so the, again, the application binary interface is how programs are supposed to run on particular operating systems. 
So for example, Microsoft used to do one way and Linux would do another one. Um, actually, Microsoft now, they, they kind of use the standard for x64. Uh, but the ABI, or Application Binary Interface, says who saves the data? And typically, it's the function being called is going to save the data because then you're not wasting data being saved. And where do we save all that data? Oh, we'll see. We're going to save it to the stack. All right, the last part is, and so again, if you go and look at shell code, you'll probably see system calls. All right, so a system call is a way for a user land program to say, hey, operating system, I need you to do something for me. Okay, so this one is, the system call is 80, which is a write. Um, write is going to go to standard out. Um, if you tell it that, right, so the arguments that you put on there, right, each OS is going to define them differently. Right? I mean, the system calls might have similar numbers between different versions of Linux, right? So that you don't have to rewrite stuff. But for example, int 80 with um, EAX being 4 and EVX being 1 is going to be right to standard out. ECX is going to have the address of the thing you want to print out. And EDX is going to say how many bytes is it going to actually do on that write. Okay? So that's the system goal. That's how you interact with the OS. So again, if you look at shell code, you're probably going to see system calls. All right. Okay, stack. So I like to think of the stack as a slug type. So it grows from the top, right, and comes down. So that's tight. Uh, if you remember the acronym, tight means tight to the ceiling. Slug might is on the floor. If you look at every single other person in the world, I don't know why they do this, they draw it the other way because it's like a stack of plates, right? As you keep putting plates on, you got to take the plates off of the top. Um, but the problem with that is that your memory adjusts start here and they get bigger as you go down. To me, that doesn't make sense, but the world has uh, decided that I'm wrong, so I'm going to have to things that's different. So the operations that we have on the stack are either push or pop. So push means I'm going to put something on top of the stack. Pop means I'm going to take it off. And take it off is logically take it off. What I really do is I take my stack pointer and I say, go up one. The pop actually copies the data into the register. That data is still there on the stack, right? It hasn't gone anywhere, right? That's just useless for the, the OS to do anything with it. And so we're going to use this stack in order to call functions, right? I talked about, we'll talk about it more a little bit. But the stack is essential for being able to recursively call functions or call functions over and over again um, and keep track of where was the previous one at? Where am I at? And oh, I've only got 10 registers. Like, oh, it needs 10 registers and I only got 10 registers. Like, how are we all going to, how are we all going to get along? All right, so I put in lots of comments here. So this is one example that I had. Oh, what are the rules? They need a rail right here. Ooh. All right. So in this example, actually, in the in the demo, I would show you guys how this works. Uh, but we actually got this loop instruction. So anybody, any assembly programmers in here? Anybody know what the loop instruction does? Probably not. So the loop instruction is going to go jump to the label listed in it, so top, if ECX is greater than zero. If ECX is zero, it will not do that. So here I put eight into ECX. I'm then pushing e ECX on top of the stack. All right, so ECX has eight, so I push that onto the stack. I go here, oh, I forgot to mention loop, decrements ECX by one. And then does the check. Oh. So it's going to say eight, seven, six, or depending on which way you want to grow the stack. So here it is in GEF. So I have broke. I have set a breakpoint. Is the type B, and then the name of the label. Right. So the nice thing about assembly is all I have to do is say some name and a colon, and it's a label, which means I can put a breakpoint in it. So as you can see here, it actually lists it. It says this is label top or function, as it might think. This is label B, which was in my program before, um, and it says plus some offset um, for that instruction. So, and then if we look up here, we can see the stack, and see it says ESP, and it's pointing to zero, zero, zero. 
I think you guys can do that. So, good thing I did all these slides beforehand. <laughs> so, now we can see that it pushed eight and then seven and then six. Again, this stack grows the wrong way, whatever. I can't do anything about it. So right now, ESP is pointing to one. So if I do a pop EBX, what's going to be an EBX? What's on top of the stack? Uh, one, right? And then I pop ECX, what's going to be on top of the stack? Two. Two. Very good. So if we look clear at the top, right? It says EBX is one, ECX is two, right? Poof. You guys all understand the stack. Perfect. <laughs> right? You guys are expert assembly programmers. Yeah. We're working, we're working our way there. All right, so we talked about the stack. So what is it used for? So it's used for either arguments to a function, I should have put this on here, or local variables. So arguments to the function. So what happens is I'm going to go call a function, and let's say it takes two arguments. I have to push those onto the stack, right? And then what did I say it does when you call that function? And when I call the function. It puts the uh, current instruction pointer on the stack. Puts the next instruction pointer on top of the stack. So I got arguments, I got my return instruction, and I'm going to do a little bit more magic, and then I got local variables, right? So those are all going to be on the stack. They're all on the stack because we're going to use this thing. So from typical program design, we use the extended base pointer. And this is actually because it's easy for people to understand, ha, my EBP is right here. I know where my function arguments are. I know where my local variables are. And I can use that to understand how my stuff works. Okay? And then the beauty of the stack frame is when I'm done with that function call, right, I basically get rid of all of the things that I had on the stack. Right? So we basically destroy it. Really, we just like move the pointer up, and then logically it is destroyed, but we don't actually do anything. Again, if you don't clean it up, Guess what? Segfault. Yeah. Right? Anybody know why it's called segfault? Segmentation. Segmentation. It's like it has to do with like stepping outside of like your segment of memory and then. Yeah, so all programs are have a certain area of memory that they can execute in. If you want to look at it and you're on Linux, go look in the proc directory. Uh, right? So the proc directory shows you all the info about every process on a system. And if you have access to it, you can look at where, what memory does each process point to. Are those segments something that were created at the OS or the kernel level for security reasons, or is that a feature of the physical x86 architecture itself? It's both. Okay. So um, early days, they had a bunch of different segment registers. So they had CS for code segment, DS for data segment, SS for stack segment. Uh, but now the OS manages all of that, and it is created for security purposes, right? So if your program tries to write to memory that doesn't belong to it, your program crash is not the thing that it tried to write memory to. Okay? So that's why we do that, is for security. Yep. All right, so we can see here that I have, we have to push. So if I, if I start with my arguments, I had to push argument three, and then push argument two, and then push argument one, and then call my function. So my return address gets there. And then what we do is because we're going to use EBP, we need to save it. So the ABI, the application binary interface on 32-bit systems says, thou shall not destroy any register except EAX. EAX is used for the return value. So you may destroy EAX. So if you're going to call a function and you have something useful on EAX, guess what? <laughs> You better put it somewhere else. So that function it can and will destroy EAX. So what we do is inside the function, sure. we push EBP. We save it and say, OK, I'm going to mess with EBP. I need to save that. And then our first local variable is at EBP. And you can see right, addresses go down, EBP minus 4. But if we do the calculation, right, each one of these is 4 bytes on a 32-bit operating system. So our first argument is at EBP plus 8. And I guarantee this is probably really hard to read. But, so this is a, a website. I put the link down there. So godbolt.org. 
lets you type in any C program or function that you want, and you can pick any compiler that you want to look at. You want to look at Linux, so you want to look at Linux with x86, you want to look at ARM, and it will show you your C code and what that breaks down to in assembly. So you can be like, even if you don't have a Linux computer lying around, you don't want to buy a Raspberry Pi, right? You can look at the code that's related to this. So again, I know it's hard to see, but um, here's where we're calling our function. We're calling it, if you look at there, there's four arguments. So the last push is 97, which is an A in ASCII. 98 is a B, 99 is a C, and then there's push negative 8 billion, I don't know, something, something, something. So that is my string left up there is Cafe Bake, right? Anybody know where Cafe Bake comes from? So isn't it the magic number for some binary format? It is for Java bytecode. That's right. Cafe this Bake. Is apples, oh. apples is, <laughs> is speed face. When, it, it, when they switch endiness, they got all scrambled. Yeah, so each one has a different one. Yeah. Um, we got magic bytes for that, so you know the file for us. I actually don't know the Linux loop, but it's been a short time. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> I think it just says ELF. Yeah. Yeah, so when they when they jumped up to 64-bit, um, they changed them to R. So, and I have one slide talking about some of those. Um, so we have sort of R with the extension, so R-A-X, R-B-X, R-C-X. Uh, then they got smart and at like, the, the next one they called R8 after they got past the first set. So R8 through R15 are actually the next ones you have. Right, so they increased it. Those are the 64 bit. There's also 128 bit. And some of them. So if you look at some of the extensions like ABX, so you got XMM, which is, um, I had it on my computer. I, I think it's 128 bits. Okay. Um, so there are bigger ones and you can do. A lot more complicated things that we'll probably not have time to talk about, but if you want, you can talk about them later. Thank you. Yep. All right, so here is my example of calling a function with many arguments. Again, you can see the push in the opposite order. So the function is called with one, two, three. We push three, two, one. Right, so that shows you push them in the opposite order. And then if we look on the stack, we can see that ESP, when I get to the function before it pushes EBP, we have them in one, two, three. Again, stack fast backwards order. <laughs> and we can see that that's how that works. Any questions? So then, you know, we, we went from 32 bit, which sort of had that type of calling convention. Now it's 64 bit. Like I mentioned before, now we have 16 general purpose registers that we can use. So what they said is, we're going to allow the first argument to go into RDI, the second one into RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, and R9. And then if you have more than that, then you push them on to the second. Anybody want to guess why we're using RDIF, we're using registers to store those arguments instead of pushing them on to the stack? Speed. Speed, right? So your processor is orders of magnitude faster than the RAM that you're writing to, right? Your processor is doing all it can to keep that processor full of instructions because it's running up here and your RAM is like, <laughs> and then your hard disk is like, it hasn't moved, right? Since, since 1980, right? Like it's moving really slow. So if we can put arguments into registers, it's going to run faster than if we have to push them onto the stack and then hopefully they get cached by our level one cache or our level two cache or a level three cache. So that's why they, they did that, right? It was for performance. But now we're sort of feeling the pain for that. If you guys look at some of the, you know, clearly it was Spectre and Meltdown, which were issues with, with caching, and the new one with the Max about the, oh, what is, they have, they have a, a, a lookup table that looks them up, and like, oh, this looks like an address. I'm going to go fetch that memory. <laughs> Literally one of this. Anyway, what could possibly go over this? <laughs> All right. And then I really love these diagrams, this person who makes them. Right? They're really excellent diagrams. Like, this is a diagram showing what is the simplest executable on Windows that you could have, right? And you can see all of the bytes related to this. Now, is this related to assembly? Yeah, kind of. But I think it's really interesting because if you're interested in assembly, right, you're probably interested in 
how these different things work. Is that a question? No. Oh. Okay. Nope. Uh, what's the handle of the guy that makes these? He does like uh, like like file container formats. Too. So it's clear up in the in the right hand top corner. I think so it's cork. Corkman.com or Corkman, hey, Corkman, dot com. Anyway, if you search for him, he's got he's got ones for you know Linux and a bunch of different ones, and I really like them because you can sort of understand. Oh well, where does that MZ come from? And it's yeah. binary. Yeah, I actually, uh, I just coaxed the Jason's and Tool Chain to compile the MZs. I haven't gotten the the loop here to work well, so I can't. I can only do a single source C file right now, but I got GCC six compiling DOS. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, like I mentioned before, right? Like doing this assembly, right? Seems really hard. And when I taught a course back in, uh, I think it was in 2012 or 2013, right? I I had well 2012. I had to use Windows because I didn't know any better. And then I think in 2013, I said, mm -hmm. screw that. I'm just going to like do my own thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So I actually made a bunch of scripts that I put together so that we could um, be able to put them together. So when you're doing assembly, right, you're going to use at the top level, you're going to use an assembler to create what we call an object file. Like on Linux, it's called a .o file. Um, so that is sort of the packaged version that like is self-contained, but GCC knows how to interpret that. Right, and put it into sort of a bigger package. Mm -hmm. um, and so I typically use GCC as both my, my linker um, and sort of the thing to build the sort of final output. Um, and what happens with the output of your GCC depends on what your target is, right? So a lot of times, right, you're just targeting whatever your OS is. Um, but like, for example, my Mac, right, and our Mac can both compile x86 and compile ARM code. Um, at the same time, or you can download a cross compiler so you can compile for some other one. Do you have a question? Oh, well, you mentioned you put PE on your slide, and obviously no one uses that anymore. Are you like a Mac OG? Well, PE is, is Windows. Oh, that's PE. Oh, no, PEF is Apple's old one. F. Yeah. Yeah, Mac OG would be it's the new one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right? Yeah. And then you can also use it to build shared libraries, right? So a uh, shared library might be used in some other code. On Windows, you know, a DLL would be your shared library. On Linux, it would be a .so. That's also a shared library. So this is the project that I made. Again, I did um, use a lot of this stuff from Paul Carter's book in order to build it. Um, so I did build it uh, for students. It does have one issue or gives you a warning about uh, position independent code, right? So nowadays, um, you're not supposed to assume uh, where your binary is in, in memory, right? And so there's a couple of fixes I need to do to make sure that that works on there. Um, so it is built for students, but anybody can download it and, uh, and is able to run it. So the sort of basic structure of the program is there is a script called um, genmake.sh. You give it a name of a project. So in the projects folder, it will create whatever the name you type in there is. If it already exists, it will not destroy your stuff. So that's good. Um, but it copies all the files, renames it so that the name of the executable, in this case, hello, is the exact same as the name of the project. So all of your binaries have a different name. Um, and then it makes a make file. So make file allows you to, you make changes, you just type make, right? And whatever files changed, and it's a really cool program, um, it will, just build those changes, right? And then you're up to date. Um, and you gotta pay attention. If it fails, guess what? It didn't make a binary for you, right? So it's not gonna work. Um, and then it includes in here a, a program called driver.c. You can put whatever C code you want in there, but in your hello.asm, there's a function called asm underscore main, which the normal hello program is going to call um, and just doing its process. You want to change it? Great. I just made it so that way students could write their stuff in assembly and say, hey, go. And it goes ahead and does that. Also, the nice thing is all of the stuff that's built into GCC or the standard C library, like printf, scanf, you know, all of those puts, right, are included because we're using GCC as well. And I found that really useful because students needed some help, right, sort of getting from zero to 
Um, so at the end of my classes, my students would actually make a game that I called Super Assembros. So it'd bind the keys, and you could move your little guy, and then you, when he hit up, he was supposed to jump up, and if there's a block above him, he's supposed to not go through it. And then I had kids that did Goombas and everything else because they didn't have time. They had lots of time. They also did colors, and so do the games with colors. And so students had a lot of fun with doing that. Um, plus, it was a final project that they would get to do. So again, here is an example. So we can see that I defined a string called hi on line 5. We then either call the print string function, which was built in um, to the libraries that we wrote, or I can actually call printf. Again, you got to know where the arguments go. So in printf, um, this is just printing a string, and so the first argument has to be on top of the stack, which is the string you want to use for printf. And I put that address into EAX. And then I went ahead and printed it. And then it prints twice, right? And of course, my spelling is terrible, so hello starts with lowercase h. So I'm real good at that. <laughs> All right, so I did use shellcode in my project because I thought that would be fun. Um, and I actually didn't do it on a Mac because Mac disables uh, read, write, execute pages now, which made me mad because I thought it used, it used to do it. Um, but shellcode is just like a bunch of binary code, where right? You can think of it in hex, right? It's usually part of a program, not a real executable. That's typically how it is, right? Um, and if you use some different things, you know, it excludes things called like bad bytes, right? So if you're executing a shellcode and it's doing a C copy of it, and if you have null in your shellcode, then it's going to stop right there, right? So you might have to exclude or work around having those bytes inside of your shell code. And then it will do things like looking up functions on the fly. Right? So I did a talk about how you know, the FBI would de-anonymize people um, on, on uh, Windows, and they basically had to go through a table inside of Windows right, process and look up the functions that it needed to call. Because right? it wasn't a real executable, it was Shellcode, it didn't have access to, <laughs> hey, where is my network connection? How can I make a connection out to the internet? So shellcode is going to have to do things sort of unconventionally because it's living in a constrained environment and it's kind of hostile to what it wants to do. <laughs> um, and then either, right, so for example, the FBI, right, they were phoning home just to get somebody's IP address, um, but attackers like you guys might want to actually <laughs> launch a shell so that you can have access to that. That system. The FBI did not want to have that um, ability for a variety of different reasons, which I can talk to later. Anyway, let's talk about it. So what I did is I used MSF Venom, right? So that's the sort of evolved version of generating a payload and encoding it. So that's what MSF Venom does. Um, and then there is a guy that wrote a really nice uh, shellcode tester that just um, executes some shellcode. So I used that to test it. And so this is my example. So I'm going to use actually floating point. Um, so I'll try and get done here in time. <laughs> but basically, floating point, we have a couple of different pieces. We have a sign bit, we have an exponent, and then we have a bunch of data. Right? And a double is 64 bits in length. So I have like plenty of room to write, say, four bytes inside of it. So what I did is I took my shell code, which is here as my input, and then I took a number, 1980, it's a very special year to me, <laughs> um, and I took that number and I basically figured out what is the difference between 1980 and if I substitute my bytes in here for part of that number, what's the difference? That gives me a number, right? it's a floating point number. Okay, do that for each one of them on my way down, and then when I go to decode it, I just do all that in the reverse order. So the first part is to generate what the difference is between the old input and what I currently have. I calculate that difference, save it. Then I have all my save stuff. It's going to print off a little thing there. But what does that look like? Move D word. Move D word. Oh, so that's assembly, right? And I talked about XMM. All right, so XMM are the 128-bit registers, so I can use those um, to load my data in. So I'm telling it to load a quad word in, 
um, and then doing the math. So what happens is I took the output of that and I shoved it in here, right? So this is the actual assembly and it loads that value that's at the very bottom into these registers. And then it says, oh, which, what's my offset? Okay, I'm gonna subtract this much from it. Well, yep, subtract. And then I'm gonna store the data. And then I'm gonna subtract RBP. So I'm going to the next one, the next one, the next one. Right, so I'm going up in data. So then my main function here, right? Line 14 is like C hackery. Um, so casting a memory address into a function is a pain in the butt in C. In assembly, it's just like move. <laughs> and you got your function and then you can say call, right? And just do it. But I didn't want to do that, so we did that. Um, and then in here, anybody know what mprotect does? Set memory protections. So I set my page to read, write, execute, because I wanted to just be able to run it, right? And then down here, I call my awesome function. Well, I call that function foo, which put the data in array. It made it into the shellcode that I wanted to execute. So what it does is here, it prints off what it decoded, right? Because I was going through testing it, wanted to make sure it works. Uh, then it executed the shellcode. The shellcode, this is generated by MSF Venom. Yes? How did you make your XX um, that's just, oh, never mind. I'll ask I think it's, uh, ZSHMI, I think is the, oh. what I use. So it does the calorie. Oh. All right. So cool story, right? I ran this through binary ninja and it's like, I don't know what this is. Like you're doing a floating point right now. I don't know. <laughs> right. So it, it had no idea. <laughs> Ghidra on the other hand. Did a little better, right? It actually figured it out. So if you look and you compare the bytes in this to the bytes over there, guess what? They match. Right? So Gidra did that, knows how to do that execution, right? That, oh, I see it's taking a constant and it's adding to that constant, it's running into memory. I'm gonna figure out what that is. Right? And it figured out all of the data that's in it. Now you can make this harder. I actually was working on this today. Right, so instead of just saying, I'm just gonna do one operation, I'm like, I'm gonna do a whole bunch, like seven billion, 70, there's thousand, 704 million, right? So if the symbolic execution doesn't know how long it's gonna take, it's gonna be like, I don't know what that is, right? And so this is totally something that you can do if you wanna obfuscate what your code is doing. And if you're using floating point, like no hacker, like they're not using. That's why Binary Ninja just doesn't even try. Because it doesn't care, because nobody uses it. So if you want to use it, there you go. And then you run this through Gaitra and it's like, yeah, I don't know what local C is. It's like, eh, it's some value, right? So, so it's totally doable to obfuscate your code by using the floating point registers, right? Because the, the uh, Disassemblers won't figure it out. Oh, look at that. I got one minute. Perfect. All right. Any questions? Comments, dad jokes. Imagine Mark. <laughs> Do you usually do any embedded? Uh, this? Jeez, my brain just got loud. Uh, embedded assembly, or do you mainly just do assembly on desktops? Yeah, so normally I'm doing it on desktops, you know, as a, for fun, right? I actually program in Python um, in my role as a CSO, but, you know, each company is different, right? We're a really small company, so I spend most of my time programming. Um, so this is something that I do for fun. Um, I also like writing challenges for, uh, you know, different uh, CTFs. Right, and so it's fun to do some different things like use, use AES to encrypt your payload. And then you gotta provide the key to figure it out, right? So there's some AES libraries you can use or doing stuff like making um, self-modifying code. So as the code is executing, it's actually modifying the instructions in front of it. Oh, wow. And so then your disassembler is like, I don't know what you're doing here. But when you execute it, right, there's some, you're just sort of manipulating it as you go, and then at some point you get to the actual thing that you wanted to execute. 
So I just do it as a hobby. Uh, I'm going to guess from the fact that you said your CSO is someone you're still teaching more. Uh, uh, when you were teaching, or did you teach? I taught at Dakota State University, which has a cybersecurity program, and then uh, University of Nebraska at Kearney is where I last taught. I'm not a Carl in Nebraska. So, yeah. Anybody else? Thanks for making it look easy. <laughs> right? <laughs> my, my, uh, the last time I gave it was like this was uh, assembly so easy and AI can't do it. Because when I first tried doing it, I'm like, hey, that's, you know, chat me GPT, right? Can you do uh, printf and assembly? And it's like assembly, 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 printf. <laughs> just like it was C. I'm like, okay, that's not right at all. <laughs> you just don't know. Right. And it it does okay, but and, and it can help you with lots of things. Like Copilot will help you with lots of things. But it doesn't sort of understand that things change. Like for example, my Mac, I wanted to be able to compile x86 code on it, and it just kept running me in circles with trying things that didn't work. Um so um, you know it's got some sort of data knowledge. Um but yeah, try to make it easy. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks for staying, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs>